Good afternoon, everyone. Afternoon. Um, I am um, I am Seth Crock. <laughs> uh, I'm senior fellow here at Hudson and uh, director of Hudson's Center for American Sea Power. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to today's uh, conference on Taiwan security, which will also look at U.S. efforts to. Um, to protect Taiwan. Taiwan is a democratic partner of the United States. It has a free press and independent judiciary and regularly conducts elections in which power is peacefully transferred between major political parties according to citizens' electoral decisions. It is a democratic friend, separated from a most undemocratic strategic competitor of the United States. And uh, that same country, China, is a strategic competitor indeed of all free societies. But the separation is 100 miles. It's also located at the center of the first island chain. Uh, the first island chain brackets China on its Pacific side. So far as China is concerned, it begins in Japan and parallels the mainland through and even beyond the Philippines. The links of this chain are allies or friends of the United States, American military presence or potential presence throughout the chain protects our friends and is key to America's past and future uh, as a great Pacific power. The defense of Taiwan is a critical strategic imperative if the United States is to remain the Pacific's dominant power. The PRC's view of Taiwan's geographic position at the center of the first island chain can be compared to uh, Lord Nelson's revolutionary naval tactics at the Battle of Trafalgar. The naval engagements before and during the early 19th century were conducted as enemy fleets assembled in the parallel lines and sought to pummel each other into submission. Nelson had a different idea. He planned to attack the French uh, Spanish fleet with a line of ships that were perpendicular, not parallel to the French-Spanish fleet. The idea was to strike the enemy in the middle of his line and then pick off the divided fleet as the ships under Nelson's command entered the breach. And it worked famously. A Chinese seizure of Taiwan, Taiwan would allow the PRC to operate from the center of the First Island chain and enable them to attack northward toward Japan and south toward the Philippines. Such an attack, if successful, would give the PRC a major advantage in subduing the American and allied forces of the First Island chain. It would help them secure the South China Sea, through which their principal source of imported oil flows. It would materially assist their effort to project power into the Central Pacific. Conversely, the control that China seeks through island building, uh, violations of neighboring state sovereignty, uh, force itself, and so-called lawfare in the South China Sea leverages their ability to take Taiwan by force. The PRC remains committed to what its rulers call reunification with Taiwan by force. When I first visited China in the late 1990s, I was asked by the government-operated research institute that invited me what bases I wanted to visit. Uh, this was when relations between Washington and Beijing were uh, a lot more friendly than they are today. I asked a former commandant of the Marine Corps, our Marine Corps, if it would be worth it to see their amphibious bases. He said, don't waste your time. 
He meant that China had invested little in amphibious capability. This has changed radically in the years since then. China is now in the process of building its amphibious forces and equipping them with the tools needed to conduct opposed landings. Large, powerful, and numerous surface combatants have been designed so that they can provide the naval gunfire that opposed landings demand. Sophisticated air defenses aboard the same ships place at risk U.S. or allied efforts to interdict the Chinese Navy's amphibious operations. China matches its military investments with real-time actions. In March, a Chinese aircraft carrier and escorts entered the Taiwan Strait for the second time this year. Earlier in the year, Chinese Air Force fighters began to accompany Chinese bombers in flights that circumnavigate Taiwan, while a Chinese spokesman told Taiwan to, quote, get used to it, unquote. So words match deeds. Chinese leaders have been attaching various timetables to take, ta take Taiwan by force. How much warning does Beijing have to give before Taiwan's friends start taking notice? Our panel today will look at what the US has done since President Trump was elected, why the security of Taiwan is so important, and what measures the US ought to take to preserve Taiwan's independence as a democratic state. The panel today, I'm pleased and proud to say, has three experts on Taiwan and US-Taiwan security uh, relations. In order of their presentations, they are Ian Easton, here, a research fellow at the Project 2049 Institute, and an expert on Asian security affairs. Uh, Mr. Easton has previously worked at the Japan Institute for International Affairs, the Center for Naval Analyses, and the Foundation for Asia-Pacific Peace Studies. He speaks Mandarin Chinese fluently and has lived and studied on the mainland in Taiwan for five years. Next is Dr. Arthur Herman, an author, historian, eminent in both uh, respect and senior fellow here at Hudson. He's published nine books, including a Pulitzer Prize finalist um, and how the Scots invented the modern world. Dr. Herman has taught at the University of the South, at George Mason, at Georgetown, and Catholic University. Last, and as they say, but not least, Dr. Patrick Cronin is the Senior Director for the Asia-Pacific Security Program at the Center for New American Security. Uh, Dr. Cronin has held leadership positions at the Institute of International Strategic Studies, the Center for Strategic and International Studies, the United States Agency for International Development, and the U.S. Institute for Peace. In the academic world, Dr. Cronin has taught security and international studies at Georgetown, Johns Hopkins, and the University of Virginia. Um, after the speaker's presentations, there will be a question period. I will do my best to remember to remind you um, that after you're recognized, would you please wait for the microphone to be delivered to you before beginning your question. Question. Um, and then would you identify yourself and your organization and the person to whom your question is directed. Thank you very much. Thank you for attending. And uh, Ian? Well, very good afternoon. It was yours. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Seth. And thank you to the entire team here at the Hudson Institute for the kind invitation. Uh, it is always a pleasure to be here. And today, I'm particularly excited because I have a friend who teaches at the Naval Academy at Annapolis. And he has been telling me, he started last year, that I have to read this book. I have to read this book. And every time I would see him, he would tell me about this book that he was reading that I have to read. And so finally, about three weeks ago, I picked it up, and I started to read it. And he was right. I love it. It's called Freedom's Forge. And then, about 
a week ago, uh, it dawned on me that my colleague on the panel here today is the author of that book, Arthur Herman. And so I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, to be on a panel with Arthur and to be on a panel with Patrick Cronin, whose work I have followed um, ever since I came to D.C., which is about eight years ago. Uh, and so here's the book, Freedom's Forge. I would highly recommend picking it up and reading it. It's fascinating, and it reminds us all of the importance of the military-industrial complex. And when you look at the situation across the Taiwan Strait today, one of the indications or one of the warnings that we have that something is amiss is this sweeping reform of China's military industrial complex and their buildup, which is directly aimed at Taiwan. Uh, and so again, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you all for taking time out of your busy schedule. Seth has asked me to address the question of what the Trump administration has accomplished so far in its support for Taiwan's defense. Now, our president has been in office for about 500 days. And so when I got the question from Seth, I thought, well, this no doubt there'll be a lot of things to talk about. And I started to make the list out, and I very quickly realized that I have what must be the easiest job on the panel today. Because I could only think of two things that this administration has done that directly support Taiwan's defense. And those two things were, about a year ago, in June of last year, the administration notified Congress of an arms sales package. It was about a $1.4 billion arms sales package to Taiwan. It included things like electronic warfare for Taiwan's uh, kid-class destroyers, torpedoes, support for Taiwan's a massive, it's a pave pause plus early warning radar called the SRP, uh, and some munitions, some advanced munitions capabilities. The second thing the Trump administration has done that directly support Taiwan's defense came in April, and that was the notification that finally, after a four-year waiting period, that the U.S. government was going to lift restrictions that had been placed on U.S. defense industrial support for Taiwan's, uh, what they call their indigenous defense submarine program. Uh, as you no doubt know, Taiwan intends to build eight or more diesel electric submarines, but it needs U.S. technical assistance to do that. The second Bush administration uh, in 2001 committed to supporting Taiwan's acquisition of diesel electric submarines. But then for a whole range of, of political reasons, both in Taipei and in Washington, that never came to fruition. And so it was about four years ago that Taiwan's government, and it was actually at, at Annapolis, at the U.S.-Taiwan um, Defense Industrial uh, Business Conference that year, where they came and they briefed everyone on this new plan that they had. But very quickly, the U.S. government said, we're not going to support that, and we are going to restrict our uh, defense industry from supporting that. Uh, and those restrictions, I'm very pleased to say, have been lifted. And so the U.S. defense industry can now support Taiwan. But that's it. In terms of direct support from our country to the Republic of China, more commonly known as Taiwan. But that is a very unkind uh, judgment. If you only look at direct U.S. support for Taiwan's defense, then we're missing something. Because Taiwan's defense and national security is about much more than just hardware. It's also about rhetorical support, moral support, the support of the American people, the support of US Congress, the support of the administration. And in this regard, I would have to say that this administration gets more than a passing grade. That we have seen our Secretary of Defense, Mattis, go to Shangri -La, the Shangri-La Dialogue in Singapore twice, last June and again just a few days ago, both times in his official remarks saying things that had never been said before by Secretary of Defense that had very positive implications for Taiwan's national security. We have seen language in the NDAA, the National Defense Authorization Act, which our president signed late last year, regarding Taiwan. This is renewed support for the Taiwan Relations Act, 
uh, renewed support for President Reagan's six assurances to Taiwan. Now, of course, one of those six assurances is that the U.S. government would not recognize PRC sovereignty over Taiwan. And so that's a, an important signal. What was also in that bill, signed by President Trump, was language that called for, and this was a sense of Congress, was not a demand, but it was a sense of Congress, that called for the administration to invite Taiwan to the rim of the Pacific uh, naval exercises that are going to be held in Hawaii uh, in the coming weeks. It also called for the administration to invite the Taiwanese Air Force, ROCAF, to red flag, the red flag Air Force exercises in Nevada. That would be a big deal. We've seen other rhetorical support. We saw the Taiwan Relations, uh, excuse me, the Taiwan Travel Act passed unanimously by Congress uh, in March and then signed by the president. Of course, he didn't have to sign it, but he did. Uh, we have seen a Deputy Assistant Secretary of State, Alex Wong, go to Taiwan. And if you look at the remarks that he made publicly, which is a big deal, uh, the remarks that he made were very positive uh, for Taiwan. Recently, we've seen indications that the administration may sail uh, naval ships, they may transit through the Taiwan Strait, and they may make that public. Now, it's important to note that whenever we talk about or whenever we're tempted to criticize uh, any administration in terms of its support for Taiwan's defense, defense and security, we always have imperfect knowledge. We always have imperfect knowledge of what's going on. There's a lot that happens under the radar that we necessarily don't know about and can't see. But so much of the struggle is a struggle for narrative dominance. So much of the struggle is a struggle for ideas. Are the ideas of Beijing and the Chinese Communist Party, will they prevail? Or will the idea that Taiwan actually exists as an independent and sovereign democracy, will that idea prevail? When the US government is silent in the face of Chinese coercion and intimidation tactics, the likes of which we've seen on a massive scale over the past 500 days, where you have Chinese bombers now regularly circling Taiwan and Chinese uh, spy planes regularly circling Taiwan, when we have Chinese aircraft carrier groups circling Taiwan, when we have live fire military exercises across from Taiwan, when we have the Chinese poaching uh, Taiwan's diplomatic allies around the world and putting pressure on international corporations to change their nomenclature as it refers to Taiwan. And, and not only international corporations, but unfortunately the U.S. State Department has also changed its nomenclature and taken Taiwan's flag off of all U.S. government websites that they possibly can uh, as of January this year, which is pretty remarkable uh, in the signal that that sends in the face of coercion from China. And so when we gauge where the administration is and what they've accomplished, I think it's important to address the question of what have they done directly to support this democratic security partner and ally that we have that faces a tremendous amount of pressure from its giant neighbor? What has the administration done indirectly to support Taiwan? And of course, many of those things that, that we can't see, they never rise to the level of uh, public disclosure. And what has the administration not done? That's also important to take a look at. What the administration has not done is actually listen to the U.S. Congress and invite the Taiwanese military to RIMPAC, the naval exercises this summer. What they've not done is invite Taiwan to red flag. What they've not done is engage in new arms sales to Taiwan because the package that was notified to Congress last June was all a holdover from the Obama administration. That was a package that had been put together uh, in the, the latter years of the Obama administration, and then they sat on it, they tabled it, and then they passed it along to the Obama administration. So, so far, this administration has not approved of any new arms sales to Taiwan. And they've certainly not approved of anything high profile. So, no Abrams tanks, which the Taiwanese have been requesting for a long time now, no new F-16 fighters or F-35 uh, stealth fighters, no new rocket artillery like ATACMS or mobile artillery like M777, no um, UAVs, drones, 
uh, which the Taiwanese have been requesting for a long time, no new surface ships. There's a long list of capabilities that the Taiwanese have been asking for for well over 10 years. And what often will happen is Taiwan's Ministry of National Defense will ask for permission first, and they'll try to pave the way so there's no rejections. They'll ask for permission, and then once they get a good sense from the Pentagon that, yeah, we think we can improve these capabilities, then they'll submit the formal letter of request, and then it'll go into the system. Well, unfortunately, what that does sometimes is that gives the any administration, whether it was the Bush administration, the Obama administration, now the Trump administration, it gives them an opportunity to scuttle potentially vital uh, defense arms and services without actually having to formally do that. Uh, and so that's an issue as well. And so on balance, this administration, I would say, gets a, uh, certainly gets a passing grade. Uh, but it is remarkable the lack of response when the Chinese government and the authorities in Beijing are engaged in, in what can only be described as blunt force trauma against Taiwan. When you're flying bombers around the country and aircraft carriers and doing amphibious landing drills, live fire drills right across the Taiwan Strait, uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar, but in April, during the, the, the defense, high-level defense talks between the United States and Taiwan, the Chinese actually built a scale model outside of Nanjing, a scale model of a Taiwanese village with giant billboards of Taiwanese companies. So there was no mistake of what was going on. And then they sent troops in for live fire exercise and they blew up what looked exactly like residential buildings. Uh, in, when I saw it, it reminded me of Taoyuan outside of Taipei. Uh, and so they're, they're destroying Taiwanese uh, villages in effigy and then they're playing it across uh, their nightly news all across China. And it's on, online. You can go and, and watch these clips. It's, it's remarkable, the intimidation tactics. And the silence from, from the US side in the face of that is remarkable. But when you look at many of those that are in key decision-making positions now, and you look at some of the things that have come out, and you look at the rhetorical support so far, from the administration uh, for Taiwan's defense and national security, I think it's fair that we should be uh, optimistic about what to expect from Team Trump in the, the months and the years ahead. I think it has to be cautiously optimistic because there's always that uncertainty that's there. But I, I do think we should be optimistic. Uh, and so with that, let me turn it back on over to our moderator. Um I just had one question here before we proceed. Um, I mean, do you see any progress on the uh, agreement to exchange senior level official visits uh, between the United States and Taiwan? Is anything happening there, or is that sort of a gesture that well, we have I have to wait and see what happens in the future? I, I think until it happens, we have to, to wait and see whether or not it does. Uh, if you asked me to place a bet, I would bet you a dollar that they will, that, that we are going to see uh, admirals and generals, high-ranking officials from the Pentagon, both civilian and military, from the new Indo-Pacific Command in Hawaii and from the 7th Fleet in Tokyo Bay, that we will see them start to visit Taiwan. And it's, it's vital that they do, because it's insane to me to think that one day our president, if there's a crisis or if there's, God forbid, if there's a war in the Taiwan Strait, and this is one of the most dangerous flashpoints in the planet, that if there's a war, our president, whoever he or she is at that moment, is going to get on the phone, and they're going to be asking for professional military advice of these high-ranking officers, none of whom have been to Taiwan. So they have no idea what the local landscape looks like, which is extremely important for any military mind. You have to see the geography. You have to know the lay of the land. You have to know what it looks like. You have to know what the landing beaches look like, what the mountains look like what the offshore islands look like and how, how, everything, how everything is placed. You have to be able to tour your security partner's bases uh, and see their equipment and see their discipline and, and get a sense for it. Uh, and so it's remarkable to me that the highest ranking US military official now in Taipei, and it's been this way since 1979, is a colonel. It's an 06. Well, gee whiz, we have a four-star general on the Korean Peninsula we have, a th we have at least one three-star uh, in Japan. Um, and 
I would argue to you that the Taiwan Strait is even more strategically dangerous than those places, because in the Korean Peninsula, we have a preponderance. We have overmatch. You can't say that about the Taiwan Strait when you're facing the People's Liberation Army and the entire might of the world's second largest economy. And so it's remarkable to me. And so I do think, though, that we are likely to start to see that, and I certainly hope that is the case. Good. Thank you. Arthur, uh, will you tell us about the strategic importance of Sure. I'll be happy to do that. And they maybe uh, think about Taiwan also and the issues that Ian just summarized so well within a larger big picture uh, of U.S. policy in Asia and where Taiwan sits in that. What I want to do in the time that I've got is to present to you two propositions. The first is, is that U.S. policy in Asia is in disarray. I won't say crisis yet, but it's in disarray. And the second proposition I'm going to put to you is, is that Taiwan and the U U.S. relationship with Taiwan, I think, holds the key to righting the ship and for getting U.S. policy in Asia right. Now, what I want to do also is to give you some idea about why I say that about U.S. policy in Asia being in disarray. What are the factors that have contributed to that and where we are in this? And there's a number of factors, I think. One of them has been the uh, friction that issues over trade and TPP has generated, not just with Japan, but also with other U.S. allies in the region. I think there's no doubt that it's something that has generated both friction within existing alliances, but also a perception which was radiated to me when I was in Tokyo two weeks ago for, for high-level discussions there, a feeling that what has happened is, is that the friction between the U.S. and Japan over trade, for example, has undermined, is working to undermine Prime Minister Abe's role as a regional leader of being someone who can say, strong relationship with the United States works. Strong relationship with the United States functions well, especially in dealing with the large ge geopolitical threat posed by China. I think everybody recognizes that Obama, I'm oh, sorry, excuse me, that Abe, and I'll talk about I'll, I'll, I'll Obama in a minute, don't worry, um, that, the, that the Abe, uh, Trump relationship has been a strong one from the very beginning of the presidency. But it frays on these issues of trade. And the issues of trade radiate out into the perception of how a alliance with the United States in the Trump presidency functions. Does it function well or does it function ill? And the trade issue is, has, I think, contributed negatively to those perceptions, not just in Japan, but in India, uh, and across the Indo-Pacific region. That's number one. Number two, the second, is has to do with the issue of the South China Sea. And here, I think we can all very much point, put the blame squarely on the Obama administration and its failure and its passivity in the face of Chinese militarization of the Spratleys and of its claims of sovereignty over the South China Sea. Uh, this has had uh, the United States sitting on the sidelines for, for, for the eight years of the Obama administration um, had did a lot to erode the perception the United States represented a strong, proactive partner in Asia and helped to shift the perception that, in fact, that the real strong neighbor to have, a strong ally to have, and, or at least not to offend in this area, was China. This is precisely what China's strategy was from the beginning, and to a large extent, it also paid off. The third factor, the third factor that enters into this is the, is the role of the United States as maritime power and as a, an assertive maritime power that protects its allies, defends sea routes, and provides the kind of extended deterrence that it's done since World War II. It was a long feeling that during the Obama administration that that perception of the U.S.'s role in Asia had eroded. And that for all of the vaunted rhetoric about a Pacific pivot or a rebalance towards Asia during the Obama years, that this was largely just that. Rhetoric, rhetoric with no following action. 
And I think what we're seeing right now, I can tell you, is a fear that in Asia that the Trump administration's policy towards Asia represents something similar. One that involves strong rhetorical support, but not concrete actions, not a concrete, coherent policy as a way in which to strengthen alliances across the Indo-Pacific region, and also as a way to respond to the growing geopolitical and economic challenge, the strategic challenge that China represents today. So what I want to do now is to talk to you about where Taiwan sits in all this and why I, why I present to you the second proposition, that the role of Taiwan and the possibility of Chi Taiwan and have strengthened those alliances could be ways in which to demonstrate to the Japanese, to the Indians, to South Koreans, to the nations of Southeast Asia, that the United States is still a strong partner, is a reliable partner, and it gets it in terms of what the larger geopolitical and strategic straits, uh, stakes in the region really consist of. And here I think a little bit of history can, hand, can, can come in, I think, handy. And that is to think about, I'm actually going to go to this slide, to think about the issue that, um, that Seth uh, raised at the very beginning of the first island chain strategy which the United States, since the Korean War, had used as the a conceptual anchor for the United States role and for the alliance system that it built in East Asia as well as in the Pacific region. As you can see from that map, the series of red dots there that represent what comes to be called the first island chain, and the Taiwan occupying one of the key strategic locations in that, sitting at the very center of that island chain, uh, whose strategic significance, we need to remember, was based upon the idea of containing communism. Uh, the first island chain strategy developed by uh, John Foster, Secretary of State John Foster Dulles, and also by Douglas MacArthur, of the idea that a US military presence and forward presence in that first island chain represented the line of defense with which to contain communism, whether in its Russian Soviet version or during and after the Korean War in its Chinese version. Um, that first island chain strategy is one that's still the uh, hallmark of US thinking and strategic thinking in the Pacific region. And rightly so, because the way in which it does control China's access and China's ability to dominate its neighbors in, the, in East Asia as well as in the Pacific region. Of course, what China has done now is to turn that strategy inside out. And the first island chain strategy, which was conceived in order to contain China, has now, from Chinese strategic thinking, has now been used as a means to project Chinese power that by dominating the first island chain, that China will be able to protect its access to major sea and trade routes, but also at the same time have the effect of dominating its neighbors as well as displacing the United States as the single most important uh, strategic presence and military presence in the region. With the ultimate aim of then using the first dominance of the first island chain to extend Chinese influence out to the second island chain, the other series of dots that extends out across to uh, Indonesia, Borneo, and to points, uh, points east from there. The point is, is that Taiwan occupies a very important strategic position, both in terms of the geographic layout of the first island chain that includes, as you can see from that map, that includes Japan, uh, and extends down uh, through to the Philippines uh, and then to the, and then to the uh, west coast of Borneo, but also a key element in Chinese strategic thinking, that all of the most astute Chinese strategic thinkers about Chinese, China's South first uh, island chain strategy for dominating the region, all realize that there is no possibility of a first island chain strategy working unless Taiwan is dominated. And if Taiwan holds the key, it's the bottle, it's the, it's the cork in the bottle that keeps China from dominating the region and from succeeding in its attempt to dominate and control all of East Asia and eventually 
uh, to spread its influence across the Indo-Pacific. Where is the United States in all this? The United States is here, from a doctrinal point of view, of course, strong supporters of the first island chain strategy. But where's the, where's the beef? Where's the support for it? Well, uh, thanks to uh, cuts in the strength of the US Navy, uh, thanks to a lead from behind and strategic patience approach of the previous administration, the Trump administration finds itself in a position of being perceived both by China and also by China's neighbors as being fundamentally weaker uh, than it was 15, 20 years ago in terms of its ability to defend that first island chain. Uh, how does US retain, regain credibility? I think one of the most important ways in which is to, is to focus on rebuilding and strengthening the alliance with the, with, with the country that happens to occupy, as I say, the cork in the bottle, and that's Taiwan, to carry through with the kinds of promises uh, and cooperate, uh, military and strategic cooperation with, uh, with Taiwan that Ian Wibben had detailed for you, so I won't review that, uh, to strengthen and make clear that the discussion that takes place here with regard to Taiwan and self-defense is not theoretical. That when you look at, for example, the book that Ian has co-authored on this subject with regard to the Chinese invasion threat, this is very real. This is something that very much plays into the way in which China thinks about how to intimidate and dominate not just Taiwan, but other Asian countries. Look what we're willing to do with regard to Taiwan. You don't want us coming after you with the same kind of ruthless methods and the same kind of overweening strength, because the United States won't stand with you anyway. That when push comes to shove, the Americans will back away. That's the perception that we must dispel. That's the perception we must dispel, not just with regard to Taiwan, but with regard to Japan, with regard to South Korea, with regard to other countries involved as well uh, that look to the United States and have traditionally looked to the United States as the defender and protector against aggression and the preserver of peace and, secu peace and security in the region. So strengthen the military context. Build in those, those state visits. Have the, the new uh, head of PACOM make an official visit to Taipei. Make those kinds of statements. Make it clear that we stand with a country uh, whose sovereignty must not be questioned and whose independence and whose democratic system must not be intimidated or overthrown by its authoritarian neighbor. And it's not just the United States that, understand, that should understand the importance of Taiwan in this. This is the, uh, the, the Jap Japan also understands the strategic significance of this region, of the first island chain. As for example, in Prime Minister Abe's conception of the security diamond of a quadrilateral relationship extending across the Indo-Pacific, an alliance involving India, Japan, the United States, and Australia. Now, what you notice about this from, from, the, from the way in which this has been portrayed in this slide is, is, that, is that Taiwan is not seen here, right? It's not even considered as a factor in the strategic diamond. I think it very much needs to be part of it because, again, it occupies a key, maybe the key position in terms of the first island chain and the ways in which a future conflict and containment in China is going to operate and is going to take place. Taiwan needs to be brought into the strategic picture, not just for the United States, but for its allies as well. It'll send a powerful signal to the Japanese, who, frankly, I've always been puzzled, what is your relationship with Taiwan looking like here? Are you, ever since the 1970s, you've stepped away and moved away from that, from that alliance from the value of Taiwan in Douglas MacArthur's terms as the unsinkable aircraft carrier, as the anchor for a first island chain strategy. Where are you now? What does that say about your commitment to allies, traditional allies over time? It'll send a powerful message there. It'll send a powerful message to New Delhi, who's also thinking about the same things. They too are puzzled. What is the United States problem with regard to Taiwan? Why aren't, isn't the United States strengthening and building those kinds of ties? and restoring and renewing that traditional alliance and the links that hold it together. Arthur, if I could just ask yeah. one question briefly before we move on. Do you think that there is any US policy or should there be a US policy that aims not only at 
Japan in uh, trying to assist with uh, improving the security of Taiwan and recognizing and giving moral and physical support? Or you know, should we, is Japan the only country ally we should look to to assist Taiwan? No, I don't think so at all. I think there's others who would also recognize the value and, and, and welcome the opportunity to show their support for Taiwan if the United States is there. And I think that's really sort of the key to with this here too. So much hinges on people's confidence in the United States as a long-term ally and as a reliable ally in the future. Ally in the future. And our history with Taiwan tends to undercut that. Our history with the Taiwan up until the Trump administration has tended to undercut that. Now we have the opportunity to re-strengthen that and to draw in Taiwan, not just in a bilateral relationship of closer ties, but also in a broader, more multilateral connection as well. Taiwan and these Navy, Taiwan and Air Force, there's so many opportunities here in which to include them as part of the, part of the family of nations uh, that defend freedom and defend uh, the security and peace in the region. And this brings us, Seth, directly to the question of the South China Sea. Here you see in this map the area in pink, the area which has been claimed by China as sovereign sea, as in effect an inland sea for China. And as you can see here, it's one that embraces Taiwan as well, is to be absorbed into China's sovereignty over the South China Sea. Here again, United States policy and the Obama administration was one of continuing passivity, of allowing the militarization of the Spratleys uh, and extension of China's claims for dominance and for the ability to project power and influence in the South China Sea and over the other claimants in, versus the other claimants in the area, claims which the International Court in The Hague has overturned and has rejected, but which China has been able to maintain in reality. Here we are, get used to it, right? That's the Chinese approach to all of these matters in the South China Sea. The United States policy has been maintaining freedom of navigation operations. It's one, something that the Trump administration has undertaken again. It's not enough. It's not adequate. We need to take a much stronger stance with regard to both the uh, uh, freedom of passage, freedom of passage throughout the South China Sea, the illegitimacy of China's claims to sovereignty over that vital inland water, vital waterway, and also at the same time to the demilitarization of the Spratleys in the South China Sea. Uh, I have called for, and I think there is still a strong occasion for the Trump administration to look for multinational forces to carry out and to enforce those freedom of navigation and safe passage uh, exercises. Uh, Australia, uh, Taiwan, Japan would welcome US leadership in this direction. We've not taken it. So it would be a huge step forward. And again, showing the United States is fully engaged, is fully uh, a, a reliable ally in the region, and to bring Taiwan in as part of those multinational exercises, as part of that multinational discussion on those sorts of issues. Huge step in helping to right the ship, if I may use that expression, with regard to US policy in Asia, but also Taiwan being crucial to it. Look at the flow of trade routes, for example, here. The, 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 trillion, the trillion dollar plus annual passage that goes through the South China Sea with Taiwan occupying a key strategic link there in that passage of, of international trade through the region. Uh, and here, a strong US-Taiwan relationship to maintain Freedom of, freedom of passage in the South China Sea, reject Chinese sovereignty over that, will go a long way to help to secure a sense of global security as well as, as, well as regional security. Now I'll mention in conclusion just two more quick aspects where again US policy has fallen down and, has, and, is, and is in disarray in which I think there needs to be some new thinking and, and rethinking. The gladius has to do with energy resources in the South China Sea. Clearly one of the reasons why China has become so interested in that region is because of the oil and natural gas resources that are, that are located there. They're not substantial, but there's a sort of, there's a disagreement here. 
international bodies such as the International Energy Agency have, have suggested that the reserves there, although substantial, are not sort of world shattering. I won't go into all the numbers. It's pointless to do so. The Chinese take a very different view. They see the South China Sea as having reserves equivalent to Saudi Arabia. That by dominating the South China Sea, that China will, in a sense, acquire a Saudi Arabia in terms of the energy resources that can be at its, at its behest and to its, and to its service. Now, as you'll notice from that map, Taiwan is located not in one of the areas with the largest resources, but again, Taiwan occupies a key strategic position here uh, in terms of the flow and access to those reserves and to the countries who have claims, legitimate claims, to energy resources in the region which China has disregarded and has pushed aside. The same is true for the next generation of energy resources in the area, which is methane hydrates. Methane hydrates, for those of you who don't know, is frozen natural gas. Methane, methane uh, hydrates are frozen natural gas. Every cubic foot of, high, of methane hydrate contains over 5,500 cubic feet of gas, of natural gas. These deposits, which are scattered around the globe, are also deeply embedded in the South China Sea. China has a very keen eye on the development and exploration of those future energy resources. They've already begun work in the South China Sea in terms of being able to extract methane hydrates uh, and to thaw them out, in effect, and convert them back convert them to natural gas. Japan, our other ally in the region, has a huge interest in methane hydrates for achieving energy independence, one of the key issues which is being discussed right now between the United States and Japan of the issue of how to wean them off of Iranian oil and Iranian natural gas. How do we do that? One of the ways in which to do that is to give them alternative sources of energy, methane hydrates being a key one, but being the energy future for the entire region here as well. Again, Taiwan is not one of the key uh, beneficiaries of those reserves, but it can be an important partner in protecting and defending access to those reserves and to making sure that exploitation and development and exploitation of those reserves are done in a way which benefits not just one country, not just one superpower, but dominates the entire region and benefits all who face onto it, including US allies here. Taiwan occupies and should occupy a key position in how America now thinks about a coherent, comprehensive strategy in Asia and the Pacific region, the Indo-Pacific region. We need to get that discussion focused here. The Trump administration has the ability and has the intellectual capacity as well as the will in which to carry it out. What we need to do now is to push that forward and make these concrete steps possible. Thank you, Robert. Patrick, what should we do? <clears throat> well, first of all, Seth, I need to say that as the objective one of the three speakers here, I can say that Ian and Arthur's books are great um, and that you should read both of them. Um, and I agree with largely, um, especially the analysis of the problem and the challenges that we face in terms of China's strategy for Ian, in terms of the strategic stakes and uh, the strategy that Arthur's laid out very well. I have a slightly more nuanced view when it comes to policy. Um, and I've just come back from my fourth trip to Asia in five weeks. So forgive me for not being fully uh, up to date with the Washington view of the world. The, the view in Asia looks quite different from what we're hearing right here, uh, <laughs> including in President Tsai's office last week, including in the Prime Minister's office of Japan last week, including in Singapore last week. Um, I've had a different kind of a set of conversations, even altercations uh, in some cases, um, starting with Singapore where in public I was taken to task as a surrogate of the Trump administration, not my uh, affiliation, but nonetheless they accused me of essentially being the American on, on scene. Um, and two of my old friends, uh, ambassadors at large, uh, former ambassador Chan Hong Chi, uh, longtime ambassador here, and Tommy Ko, um, took me to task for representing a revision of the One China policy, of ripping up history and ripping up the Shanghai communique um, and talking about a tighter relationship with, with Taiwan. Um, so I had to walk them back 
from their argument and explain why they were not right. Um, but if they heard this conversation, they would say, you know, see what we're talking about? <laughs> they, they, are, they do want to rev up the one-China policy. And maybe that's ultimately what happens, but I believe that the Trump administration's first 500 days were all about trying to strike a balance. And it was the same thing I heard from President Tsai, which is we're trying to actually preserve a status quo, but it's a dynamic status quo. It's dynamic because China is following a comprehensive pressure strategy that has partly been outlined, but it's actually more pernicious than Ian outlined because it's not really just the military security pressure or the knocking off of diplomatic representation from Burkina Faso or maybe the Vatican in the future, or trying to get in-flight magazines to re recognize Taiwan as a Chinese territory. I mean, it gets ridiculous. But um, it's, it's pernicious because, as President Tsai told me, um, it is fomenting uh, an internal insurrection and opposition to reform and policy within Taiwan. China has learned from Russia in this case, right? It's the fake news problem on steroids in terms of the ability for China to truly get inside uh, Taiwan's democracy and market economy. So that's why uh, Ian's not quite right as well, I think, about, you know, he alluded to uh, indirect or things we can't see. You can be sure there's probably intelligence support and other types of support, including B-52 bombers, by the way, from Guam. Very direct support, I would add, flying over the median line of, of the cross strait uh, by the United States to send a signal to China about uh, trying to use threats of force against Taiwan. So the administration is trying to walk this tightrope between this vision and the importance of what's happening and the reality of China's pressure strategy. Again, agree with everything you say on that, but with the constraints on not just the United States policy, but also on our allies and partners uh, throughout the region. So let me just make three points here. The first one is trying to think through Trump administration's free and open Indo-Pacific. That's the moniker given. And, and I, I'm, I'm in more agreement here with Arthur probably that unfortunately these are still rhetorical flourishes coming out of our administrations. And China sees that, and they know we're somewhat weak in terms of not following through on our statements. We need to do much more. So I think we're all in agreement on that issue. Um, but let me still say that there's a strategy behind the free and open Indo-Pacific strategy. Uh, when you think about what Matt Pottinger and Randy Shriver and others have been putting together uh, for the administration, um, and it does account for things like the Quad relationship with China, uh, with it, when India and Australia and Japan, and it thinks broadly across this Indo-Pacific, just as China is reaching out with the Belt and Road Initiative and a Maritime Silk Road to try to expand uh, its interests and then militarize, essentially securitize those interests, mm -hmm. creating bases in Pakistan and Djibouti and elsewhere uh, to as a stepping stone toward projecting power well outside of the first island chain and even second island chain. Um, but then you come closer in, and there is this essentially maritime insurgency that China's waging inside the the first island chain, and inside the South China Sea in particular. It, it's a maritime insurgency, and it's, it's mobilizing the maritime militia and oil rigs and coast guards, and not just the gray hulls that we are sort of using with our freedom of navigation operations, and they're winning that insurgency. So we need a, a, a broader uh, maritime counterinsurgency. No doubt. Um, and that's one of the things I'm trying to help uh, develop and think through. But then you get to Taiwan, and, and Arthur's right on this. I mean, this is, in the end, this is where, this is the, this is the flashpoint. Because <laughs> this, is, this is the closest to the mainland. This is where it does come together. But the challenge here is that, again, we've created communiques and commitments and obligations, and China has growing power and tentacles uh, around uh, the military, economic, political, and even internal um, dimensions of Taiwan. So it's very important to think through how we do this. So China's maximum pressure campaign um, needs uh, something equally uh, strategically effective, and, and I think we're all searching for that. Um, we have, the United States does, a strategic, a moral, and a legal obligation, but it is still nuanced and conditioned on, in terms of some obligations. It's strategic as we talk about the free and open Indo-Pacific because we can't have an inclusive vision uh, what the Chinese would call a win-win future for all um, with free and open um, sort of access and support for liberty without helping to support uh, Taiwan. It can't, you can't have both. It comes, to, again, to a point to this. This is the first challenge. 
we have a moral obligation because um, the United States stands for the little guy. It's not going to sit by idly, I hope, in the future and let an authoritarian power um, tear apart uh, and quash freedom. I mean, I think that's where our values come into play. And unfortunately, the free and open Indo-Pacific strategy of the administration has downplayed soft power and democracy and the rule of law, which is one of our strengths. Um, and when you think about Taiwan, um, the democratic voice is one of the things that we should be harping on. And we're not really able to stand very tall on that issue because we downplay it in the region. Um, and then we have obviously legal obligations as we talk about the Taiwan Relations Act. And there, the uh, administration having reaffirmed that in the six assurances, that's, that is a strong point for the administration. We have um, tried to support, I think, the US government and the Trump administration support Taiwan's self-defense capabilities. More needs to be done. But there are limits to what Taiwan can purchase. There is no amount of money that can buy your way out of this problem. And Taiwan knows that. But building up their indigenous technology and fourth industrial revolution type technologies that go along with things like the submarine program um, are both a, a kind of dual use security and economic um, cooperation that could go a long way toward helping. Japan is playing a huge role, by the way. Japan is three times more popular than the United States inside Taiwan, um, according to President Tsai. Uh, and um, they are um, given a lot of credit by Taiwan for all of their support. Um, but it, and they're not alone. I was with India, Australia, Japan, Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore, the Philippines, all supporting and wanting to help Taiwan in terms of maritime security cooperation, in terms of intelligence. Um, and, and, but Arthur is right. It, without US leadership, they will not be there. Oh. Um, and, and so that is where this comes together. And that's sort of the, this is the, this is the trade off. And I, you're saying, let's do more. I agree. But you also know it's difficult. I mean, so, um, but um, President Tsai said one thing, and that's that um, we need loud friends, she said. And I said, that's the Americans. And she said, yes. <laughs> you know, We need loud friends. And if America's not loud about this, then nobody else will be. And so it is important. But I would argue we also need some nuance and understand, as President Tsai does, that we do not want to give Beijing the excuse to clamp down with that use of force that they're trying to build up and the pressure that comes together with cyber and a lot of other political subversion that would hopefully, in their view, shut things down. Um, so we're going to deny them that uh, sort of excuse and rationalization, just as they ignore us in the South China Sea and the Permanent Court of Arbitration ruling of July 2016. We're not going to let them uh, sort of slip around this issue with some flimsy excuse that I heard in Singapore hinting at, essentially kowtowing to the Chinese, that um, we are doing the revisionism. Now, China is doing the revisionism. We are trying to support uh, an order forward and adjusting it um, that is free and open. And we want China to be part of that. But we do not want unilateral changes by coercion and force. And Taiwan is where it really comes to a point. So we've done other direct things, by the way, like demarch countries, or demarch the World Health Assembly, rather, to try to get uh, Taiwan's representation. That's taken some political courage to do that repeatedly and to put together a Friends of Taiwan group to do that. Um, but these are relatively small actions when you consider uh, the mounting pressure from China um, and the need for, uh, and the stakes of what, what's a, what, what is at stake here, as has been pointed out. So Seth, I'll stop there. It's hard to add to these two very good presentations, but I hope that's added a little color. <laughs> that's very helpful. I, uh, and as uh, the impartial moderator that I am and I'm supposed to be, I would also like to put in a word for both excellent books that um, we've heard about today, Arthur's and Ian's. Um, I, let's begin the question period here. Um, I, could I repeat, I will, uh, my request earlier, and that is that when I recognize you, would you wait for the microphone before asking your question? Identify yourself and say to whom uh, your question, which I would like to see in the form of a question, um, is addressed. Uh, John? Uh, 
I'm John Sandoz, and I uh, really appreciate all of the presentations. My question has more to do with the narrative here in the U.S. and the will of the American people to, to actually chance the arm here with Taiwan. Uh, one of the things that, that is an issue is the fake news that uh, is generated. And Taiwan, you know, the, the situation in Taiwan doesn't get tremendous amount of visibility within the American public. Uh, and so the question is, uh, what conditions need to occur before the policy that you advocated, that is to make Taiwan the key of our South China Sea policy, before that is doable politically uh, in, in, in the Congress and the country? Can I give a venture, and then I'll turn it over to my two, uh, two worthy colleagues. Um, I would say part of it is just simply an education is where Taiwan is today. I think a lot of the perception that's taken place, in our, a lot of the perception of Taiwan in the United States, even by those who think of themselves as being informed in what's happening around the world, being involved in current events, is shaped by views that are 20 years old. Uh, that includes the view of China, by the way. I think that's finally beginning. That that ocean liner is finally beginning to shift around to the idea that somehow U.S. and China are, you know, are, are headed towards a, a golden era of cooperation through our the growth of trade and connections. And I think that's beginning to fade. I think also from the point of view of Taiwan, I think there is still the view that was shaped by the um, uh, by the two China policy. Uh, and by the one China policy and the, conf the, the, sort of the, the way that was resolved as a one China, and that is people still think of Taiwan as a province of China. I think that's still that perception that it's a, that it's a country inhabited by people who are you know, refugees from, uh, from the Chinese Civil War and that legacy of Chiang Kai-shek, et cetera, et cetera, still hangs over a lot of the perception that takes place. I think a lot of people would be shocked by the recent polls, for example, in Taiwan, which uh, when they asked about, you know, who do you, how do you think of yourself, right? Do you think of yourself as Chinese? Do you think of yourself as Taiwanese, as Formosan, and so on? That the number of number of, of residents of Taiwan who now think of themselves as being Chinese is in single digits. I think that comes as a shock to Americans to understand that, to think about that, and what reunification would really would be all about compared to the way in which, when I was in college, people would talk about reunification. It seemed to be an inevitable process. And now we realize, no, it's actually going to be uh, something uh, more, more akin to uh, uh, an Austrian Anschluss than it is to, and to a reunification of the two countries, maybe even, maybe even more stark uh, than that. So I think an education about where Taiwan is, about the vibrant nature of its democracy, uh, of the fact that it is a, an island of both of, of, of economic prosperity, high-tech industry, but also imp of, of important strategic and military significance for the United States would make a huge help in shaping the, shaping the discussion. That's at the big picture. Now maybe you'll get a more focused and more nuanced view on that from the other two, our other two participants. I mean, I just pile on the idea. I'm, you know, the big narrative is important, but the little things are also important. And I'm worried about the brain drain out of Taiwan. Um, and when I talk to President Tsai and Joseph Wu about this, they need to think creatively about encouraging the younger generation in Taiwan to see optimistically the future that they have in their southbound economy, in the defense, in the politics, because those are all strengths that we can cooperate with in terms of science and technology and healthcare. Mm. And Taiwan's a world leader in healthcare and hospital management. Um, it's working so diligently in these high technology areas. There's some great things that should be attracting younger people uh, and to stay and to work and work with the United States, work with Japan, to work with other countries. Um, and we should be encouraging that bottom up as well as the top down. Now, obviously, B-52 flights are not something you want to do every day, but Ultimately, it's showing up and, and being present and encouraging um, Taiwan's leadership to have the courage to stay free and to stand up for what they believe 
intelligently, just as President Tsai is trying not to tip over the balance and provoke, but is trying to stand up for the freedom that 23 million people want a democracy. Um, and they're the 22nd largest economy, and we, would, we want to help support that. So I think this will become obvious if we become more engaged in the South China Sea, and that's one of those issues where we've been, our, our rhetoric has been ahead of our action. What is it, who is it who said 90% of success is showing up? Mm. Right. That'll be 90% of success of U.S. policy in Asia. And I can only add that the confusion that most Americans feel and experience when, they're, when they learn a little bit about Taiwan or when they hear about the tensions that are rising across the Taiwan Strait or when they hear about the one China policy, th part of it is, I think it is 90%, either you show up or you don't. And unfortunately, policy, especially our State Department, has not showed up when it comes to Taiwan. And so our own policy, our own State Department is confused about whether or not Taiwan exists as a country. We recognized Taiwan's government from 1949 until 1979. And we had diplomatic relations, we supported them at the UN, we had a mutual defense treaty. And then all of a sudden, overnight, on January 1st, 1979, they no longer existed to us. And only the People's Republic of China existed to us as a matter of policy. And the US government, ever since then, has gone out of its way to delegitimize Taiwan's government, to pretend that it doesn't exist. They've even gone so far as to take Taiwan's flag, which again, we recognized and we would have gone to nuclear war over from 1950, well, the, the defense treaty was 54 until 78. And then all of a sudden, it no longer exists to us. And so the State Department is taking that down and has gone out of its way to delegitimize this legitimate government. This government, this country that, involve, that enjoys popular sovereignty, that has a US-style election every four years. Now, that's pretty incredible. And so it's no wonder that the American people and American media and American professors and, and students uh, and those of us in the think, think tank community are confused, and our allies and our security partners in Singapore and around the world, it's no wonder they're confused, because our own State Department, our own policy is confused that events on the ground, the facts on the ground have changed over time. They have changed, and they continue to change. That Taiwan's relationship with China, our relationships in Asia, they're all changing all the time. And our policy, unfortunately, has not caught up to events. And so this is why I think it was so healthy that President Trump, then President-elect Trump, took a phone call from President Tsai Ing-wen of Taiwan. That created a debate uh, in this country, and that put Taiwan on everybody's mental map, at least for a little while. And if there was a ship visit or a ship transit through the Taiwan Strait or a particularly notable arms sale like F-35s or new F-16s, something like that, or THAAD, something like that would put Taiwan on everybody's mental map, and we would start thinking about this, and we would start having these debates. And we're not going to get there right away. We shouldn't be expected to. But one of the beautiful things about our system is it does allow for these debates. And it does allow, ultimately, for the facts to prevail. And I think that's we need to start to base our policies based on the facts and less on fear. Because unfortunately, most of the policy decisions uh, that I see in my research regarding Taiwan, and most of the conversations I have with diplomats, not only in Washington, but in allied capitals around the region, these are policies based on fear. It's not based, we're not making policy based on the merits, whether they make sense for us, whether they're not, they're in our national interest, or whether or not they help us achieve our foreign policy goals, like Arthur was talking about. No, it's just based on fear. Well, we're afraid to do that. We don't know what China's reaction would be. And so when you base your policies on fear and not on facts and, and what's in your own national interest and, and that you've considered that and you have a consensus about what you, you think your strategic goals are, then it's, it's no wonder we're confused. And so I, I fully agree with my colleagues on the panel. We have to do much more in terms of public education in our country. And I think it, it behooves our State Department in particular to have these types of discussions. I believe they are right now. And to start to think about, OK, what can we do within the current framework without, without provoking anything catastrophic? What can we do that's reasonable, that's moderate, that's step-by-step? Step? 
we start to bring our policy in line with the objective reality uh, that is Taiwan's existence. Question over here about the third row. Yes. Hello. Uh, thank you to all the panelists for excellent presentations. My name is Peter Zen. I'm with the law firm of Foley Hoag. We represent uh, foreign countries before international courts and tribunals, including the Philippines against China. And I do have some comments about some of the remarks made in that respect, but I will um, hold off on that. My question concerns something completely different. I was wondering whether, uh, and this is a question addressed to uh, any of the panelists, whether you believe that the US government could take any steps through the private sector um, to advance our interests with regards to Taiwan. And I ask this question in light of recent news um, with regards to Facebook cooperating with China and limiting certain news sources or limiting the, the media that gets, um, that gets publicized throughout not only Taiwan and China, but also throughout the rest of the world. And since most of our discussion today has been in the public sector, I would like to uh, hear some comments about any options through the private sector. I mean, yes, it was underscored three times uh, is the short answer. But first, uh, as I mentioned, not just in-flight magazines and hotel web pages, China's going after the private sector now as well. So anybody doing business with Taiwan, um, especially if they're not uh, essentially signing up to the one China, not just policy, but principle, <laughs> in effect, um, is being penalized by China. And so there's a trade-off going on. But yes, the private sector can and should be doing more. That's why we should be looking at areas. That's why the southbound policy of President Tsai needs to be supported. And moving into India with a major sort of investment in the biochemical industry where um, essentially Taiwan can help create uh, manufacturing uh, for consumer exports from India and also help with their midstream. That's the kind of thing we can do. We can work inside Taiwan, our companies, uh, international companies. Um, from from everywhere around the world. So yes, there ought to be much more economic interaction. That strong economy, along with the strong democracy, are really the recipe for this, the confidence and survival for the Taiwanese people to make the decision they want to about their future. Uh, other questions here? Let's see. Over here, closest to the mic. Hello, thank you for a very informative presentation. I'm Paulina, I'm from the Global Taiwan Institute. Um, and I have a question about, um, or this is directed for Mr. Arthur Herman. Um, so Taiwan imports a majority of its energy from China. And when it comes to renewable energy, Taiwan doesn't necessarily have the land to sustain itself. Um, and so I'm wondering what can the US do in terms of policy to aid Taiwan in energy should China move to absorb Taiwan? Great question. Um, and what I would say is very similar to what I would say if you ask the same question with regard to Japan uh, or other East Asian countries which don't have indigenous energy resources to exploit and to open up. And I would say there's two, there's two things. One is US uh, energy exports. I mean, we are now emerging as a key exporter of oil as well as natural gas. And making sure that that is a way in which Taiwan can remain energy independent from China, that would be a huge goal. That would be a very important strategic goal as well as an economic goal. And again, it would be a way in which we undergird the idea that, you know, that this embattled island, right, this embattled island deserves our support and deserves our help, including private sector, including private sector. The second one I'm going to is. Again, the energy resources in South China Sea, including methane hydrates. I think I could very easily see, a, we talk about the quad, right? You see a quad alliance between the United States, which we have big methane hydrate resources up in the Arctic area. Japan, which has enormous methane hydrate resources off their southeastern coast. India, which also has very large methane hydrate resources. And Taiwan, which I don't think I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm not informed in the degree to which they may be, but they, they may be sitting on that. But certainly they could be beneficiaries and even contributors to the work on the technologies to make 
peaceful and safe ex, uh, expropriation of methane hydrates into natural gas, an important, an important part, of, a part of the future energy economy. Um, this would be an area in which, again, the idea of it is, and I think we all share this idea, is to think about Taiwan as part of the community of nations, not as, a, not as an asterisk, not as treated as it is in the Olympics as a province of China, right? But as a nation, a standalone, a standalone independent nation, a democracy that with which the U.S. has long-time treaties, with which we have uh, a strong uh, relationship uh, that goes back goes back to go back to the Korean War, uh, and with whom we share the similar democratic and market-driven values in comparison with the country that seeks to dominate and to absorb them. It's a great. I think it's a great story. It's a wonderful narrative, and it's a role the United States can play again and again and again. And I think uh, giving a shove here and there to the State Department to step up in that regard. This is the time to do it. This is the administration that can get it done. Just adding to Arthur's first point, and it's Taiwan's policy under President Tsai to increase the dependency on natural gas. So if you think about the shale revolution, what we're supposed to be exporting, there's an obvious marriage of, uh, of business to be done there. Yep, I would think so. Uh, Sun Zhou from uh, Shanghai Institute for International Studies, China, and also a visiting fellow in CSIS. And uh, Taiwan issue is uh, the core interest of China, and also one China policy or principle is the red line between the US or uh, China and China. And uh, my first question uh, to Ian, and uh, because uh, you're from uh, 2009, it is said that China will Get uh, get Taiwan back, and um, in uh, always say, um, China Taiwan China mainland will have been reunified um, by 2049. Do you think it is possible? And also, um, in what kind of way, um, the U.S. can endure or accept or support uh, this? Uh, what kind of um, this kind of uh, method um, of this unification. And also to answer, because you also mentioned the uh, US uh, leadership in East Asia. And, but uh, in my uh, research, it, uh, usually the US, uh, even including China, and support um, the centrality and the leadership of ASEAN in East Asia. I wanted to know how to define the U.S. leadership in East Asia. Thank you. Well, thank you for that question. Um, I'm an optimist. And so I would like to think that by the time we get to the year 2049, and probably by then I'll be about ready to retire, <laughs> that by that year, Taiwan will still continue to exist as an independent sovereign state whether it's called the Republic of China, whether it's called the Republic of Taiwan, or whether it's called something else, that ultimately that should be for the people of Taiwan, the 23 million citizens of Taiwan, to decide. Uh, and I'm optimistic, I'm hopeful that Taiwan will see that future. And I'm also hopeful that by that time, the People's Republic of China will no longer be called the People's Republic of China, because it will no longer be dominated by the Chinese Communist Party, that there'll be free and fair elections, and that there will be political evolution uh, in your country between now and then. I hope for your sake and for the sake of all of China's people that we can look forward to that type of future, and that it will be peaceful, that whatever happens between now and then will happen in a peaceful fashion. But to your question, is it possible that China could actually invade and conquer? Now, we like to use euphemisms almost like we're Leninistic, right? Any good Leninist has great euphemisms for awful things, monstrous things. So you would never say, I murdered somebody. You'd say, I liquidated them. I, I eliminated them. I neutralized them. It sounds much better, right? So when we talk about the absorption of Taiwan, we're not really talking about absorption. We're talking about an invasion and occupation, a hostile invasion that would result in hundreds of thousands, probably millions of deaths deaths and tens of millions of people that are displaced internally and externally. 
Uh, it would be a nightmare. It would be the greatest disaster of the 21st century if China invaded Taiwan. And it would represent, ultimately, the greatest failure of American foreign policy, defense policy, national security policy, and intelligence in 100 years. It would be a once-in-a-century disaster for that to happen. And the way we make sure that doesn't happen, because of course we know the PLA is building up for this mission. I've written on this extensively. There's no question. There's extensive documentation that shows the PLA has been ordered to prepare for the invasion and occupation of Taiwan under the worst possible scenario that, that PLA generals can envision. And they're doing that. They're building up at breakneck speeds. And so is it possible that there could be this catastrophic war? Yes, unfortunately, it is possible. But what can we do in the United States to make sure that never happens? Well, one of the things that we need to do, as Arthur said and as Patrick said, we need to improve our policies. We need to improve our strategies. We need to build up our military power as a deterrent. And we need to do more to support, both rhetorically and especially in terms of concrete gestures of support, some that we won't see in the public domain, like the B-52 flights, and others that we definitely, everyone will know about, if we do ship visits, for example, uh, or uh, high-profile arms sales, and I would expect to see that in the coming months, that everyone will know. And that's very important, and it's very important that we do, because if we wilt in the face of intimidation, that encourages Xi Jinping to continue bullying Taiwan and bullying us. That encourages bad behavior. That tells him, sir, your, your intimidation against me is working, so you should do more of it. And you'll keep getting more of what you want. And unfortunately, over the past 10 years, it wasn't just the Obama administration. It started in the latter half of the Bush administration, but especially in the Bush administration and partly in the Trump administration, we have seen the United States cower in the face of coercion. Mm. We're seeing that right now. And there's so much more that we can and should do to make sure that we're very clear about what's at stake for all of us, and so that there's no temptation, and that a peaceful solution is ultimately found. You know, right now, China feels that the tide of events is moving in their direction, right? If I may borrow an old, a phrase, a Leninist phrase, the correlation of forces is working in China's favor, historical forces, economic forces, geopolitical, et cetera. Um, and they see the United States retreat not as a matter of a choice of policy or passivity, but as an historical inevitability. So they see, their, they see history moving in their direction. And a lot of, right now, a lot of our neighbors, a lot of our Asian allies are wondering if China might be right. And there's a hedging that's taking place. You see that with India, with Prime Minister Modi, for example. But think about this from an historical perspective. That same phrase, correlation of phrases, of forces was precisely the way Leonid Brezhnev used to describe the Soviet Union's advantages over the United States in the late 70s. The overall view on the part of analysts, policy analysts in Moscow, was correlation of forces running in the Soviet Union's direction. And I can even remember a diplomat, American diplomat, telling me a meeting and discussing at the UN uh, Soviet activities in the, in the Horn of Africa, 1979, with a diplomat from a major African country, and that diplomat scoffing and saying, there's only one superpower today, Soviet Union. That was 1979. Think where they were 10 years later. Right? And how much of that was the effect of not so much correlation of great impersonal faces, forces, but of the will and determination of an American president and the men and the, and the women who surrounded him who were determined to reverse the direction in which the rest of the world thought everything was tending just 10 years earlier. Can I just pick up on this thread? Because this is a very important point. It goes back to the question about how do we draw a narrative as well. Um, let me take the trends in the region. So the way the region looks at the next 12 years even, by 2030, China, the world's largest economy, maybe a 500-ship navy, America not still even reaching the 355-ship navy, um, and Meanwhile, partners and allies, President Tsai included, said, my biggest concern is the question of American reliability. It's my uncertainty. That's today. So uncertain, uncertainty about how we're going to be in the region and the trends. So that makes it very difficult. And now you get down to 
the teaching point from China, you know, core interests. China will look for the opportunity. That's why we don't want to give them that opportunity. We want to be ready for that opportunity. Um, but it is to try to teach us that they care more about their core interests than we care about our core interests. And so this is not really just a narrative about Taiwan. This is a narrative about America's role in the world and our future in the 21st century. And if we're not going to be engaged in the 21st century in the Indo-Pacific region, we're not going to be a major power. And if we don't stand up for where the little guy right in the front line of this challenge could be tested, we will lose all credibility and we will, we will recede. So that's why this matters. It's not the Taiwan narrative. It's really the US narrative. And I think the Amen. national security strategy last year got that right in terms of this is large strategic com competition. And by the way, what is the Trump administration's basic strategy in, in the Indo-Pacific? It's to manage down the North Korea problem and manage up our ability to compete, especially with a rising China. I think that's the right strategy, but we have to do a lot of things to make it actually happen. <laughs> well, <clears throat> we have time for, we don't have time for one more question. <laughs> However, there will be one more question. Uh, gentleman here in the first row. Thank you uh, for the uh, great uh, presentation. Uh, uh, my name is Mitsuo Nakai, uh, Reagan Foundation. Uh, what you said is absolutely right. Uh, South China Sea is, is going to be, uh, if it explodes, it's going to be really big problem, bigger than North Korea. Uh, I was thinking uh, th there might be two things we can do to compete with China or against China. One of the two is TPP, which President Trump withdrew. And that one is a long and complicated uh, uh, package, uh, something like a thousand pages or something. No, that if we can, I agree with uh, uh, Prime Minister Abi, by the way, you know, if we can revise that and make it better and workable, amongst the uh, Asian nations. And I, if we do it right, I think that could be a, one of the two ways that we can compete. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I'm going to not say much about TPP, although I would note that there is now an effort underway towards what's called FFT to try and develop a revised trade pact. Full, it stands for full fair trade. Uh, what the, the an right, anachronism, yeah. but it's a basically TPP revised and redone, just along the lines you're talking about. But I'm going to say something very quickly about North Korea, and that is what the, that the ability to solve the crisis in the Korean Peninsula is a huge importance to the United States, enormous priority. And what the Trump administration has been able to do deserves full plaudits. And what will happen at that summit that takes place June 12th, we don't know where that leads in the whole process of denuclearization. Hugely important, no doubt about it. But it has come to dominate not just the news cycle, but also the policy cycle. Mm. And I think and the news media loves it because got, you've got two conflicting personalities, and they love that aspect of it. The US-China com competition doesn't have two big personalities to dominate it. It's not how that functions. But it is, in terms of the future of the region, even more important than resolving the issue about North Korea. Even more important is figuring out a way in which we can deal with the China challenge and of reasserting American leadership, not just on the Korean Peninsula, but across the region, and securing and reassuring our allies through all of that. And I, and I think one of the reasons why the, the, uh, you talk to, for example, you talk to our allies in the region is a feeling like our eye is on the North Korean ball and we're missing out on so much else that's taking place. You agree, Patrick? I, I do, but obviously we haven't had really an alternative these last couple of months. Things have no, been, absolutely. And, it's but, the nature but, of but we need to stay focused on the real strategic issues. And you're right. So after June twelfth, hopefully we come back to strategy. Yeah, let's and let's 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 uh, straighten up and fly right. <laughs> uh, on the question of the real strategic issues, um, I uh, encourage you to stay tuned because we will be addressing this later this summer and in the fall. Um, and I'd like to thank our panelists, Patrick, Arthur, Ian, 
for an okay. excellent presentation today, and I'd like to thank you all for joining us. Yep. Okay. Thank you. All right, great okay. job. Thank you. Lots of fun. Yeah. Yeah, you can just be right here. Well.